salmon of vanilla, just a salmon of knowledge, just a salmon of vanilla, just a salmon of knowledge, just a salmon of vanilla, just a salmon of knowledge podcast. Hey, salmon skins, welcome to another episode of Edwin Salmon of Knowledge, the podcast where I, Edwin Salmon, just talk about things in a sort of a stream of consciousness way. I don't know what I'm going to talk about when I start these podcasts. I hope you enjoy them. I hope you enjoy my ramblings. I hope some of you enjoy the weird noises I make with the saliva in my mouth in between certain words. There you go. There's a little bit of... uh, Well, I did that on purpose. That wasn't like an organic bit of saliva juice. Well, I mean, it was organic saliva juice. I didn't make it in a lab in a test tube. It's the saliva that's in my mouth. But uh, guys, I hope you're all doing okay. I know this is a strange time. (laughs) Crazy times, huh? Strange times. Weird times. Uh, Sure, look, this is it. Um, Sure, all we can do is do what we're doing and look out for each other and stop hopefully giving out about joggers. Um, God, I remember at the start of this whole lockdown pandemic thing, I was just obsessed with joggers and joggers were like everywhere in the sort of bane of my life because they were the ones that were you know running past you and in close quarters and breathing out of their mouths really sort of heavily and uh i was terrified every time i approached a corner i'd like jump out onto the road you know putting myself in danger of oncoming traffic just to avoid joggers I forgot the ratio and the mathematical equation. Cars are equal to or greater than joggers when it comes to, uh, you know, getting damaged by having them run into you. If a jogger runs into you, you know, you get sweaty. You might get some juice on you. Um, If they're breathing heavily at the time, directly into your nostrils or your mouth or your ears, or your eyes, and that COVID might seep into you. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. It's, um, there's no one around these days. Uh, there's not nothing to do, nowhere to go. Um, I should be doing like a podcast a day or something, but I, I don't want to waste all my energy and all my thoughts, because uh, I'd run out of them. Because there's nothing I can do except, uh, you know, sit here and watch movies and talk about them. And to that end, uh, I have watched the second half of Bridgerton. In the last episode proper of the podcast, I had watched half of it with uh, my lovely Cara. And, uh, I mean, we were kind of disappointed that there wasn't uh, an overabundance of sort of horniness we were kind of promised horniness, uh, that there would be a level of horniness. At least 70% of it would be, eh, this is pretty horny. But as it turned out, we were like, oh, this isn't getting very horny. But let me tell you, whew, the second half of Bridgerton, my, 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 it gets horny. Um, there's some very horny scenes. There's a bit of a nipple uh, in one of the scenes. And it uh, it was enjoyable. I mean, it was a very enjoyable romp and a pure fantasy because I remember reading about people back in that era and uh, how filthy they were and how, how little that they washed. And that's why they wore wigs uh, to cover up their greasy hair. And that's why they wore makeup to cover up their horrible skin. And they put loads of like powder and and perfumes and smelly stuff just layers and layers kind of like what a teenage boy does with Lynx Africa you know he'll be sweating he'll stink but he won't wash himself he'll just spray another layer of Lynx Africa and uh, whistle to himself I'm very smelly from outside, running round with my friends outside. 
and play in sport. I got and sweaty and I stink. Salty and really stings your nostrils. I shake the can, spray it away from you. I spray under my arms and my crotch, that will do. And the girls will smell Lynx Africa. And all the girls will want to be my girlfriend. And because of ads, I believe the ads, I believe the ads. Now, I know I've done Africa before, I've sung it before in one of the early episodes, but uh, that was different lyrics. So cut me a break, guys. I'm talking about new stuff. I'm talking about Bridgerton. Um, yeah, lots of lots of shagging. Lots of naivete. Uh, we're the main character who sets up uh, a kind of a fake relationship with a sexy duke. And then they just become friends because the pressure's off, you see, because they're not courting. And they're just like hanging out. And there's no expectation that they're going to be in a relationship. There's no expectation that they have to get married. And uh, they fall in love. They become like best friends and fall in love. And that's a good way to start a relationship. Start off as friends, uh, enjoy each other's company. And then, you know, it's like, oh, well, maybe uh, we could be friends with extreme benefits. Uh, Terminate the friendship with extreme sexiness. Make it into a marriage. Meeting potential suitors talking about dowries, squeezing their goats to see if the goats are healthy, just to see, you know, you got a good you got a good herd of goats here. What else have you got? They might have a carriage, they might have a, a cottage in Scotland. And you're like, okay, all right, fair enough. But if you marry a duke, I mean, your quid's in. And the duke in it, like he's got this, he basically... He he was a, a stutterer when he was a child and his father disowned him because he was ashamed that he couldn't speak proper. And then he uh, hated his dad and he only came back to London because his dad was dying. And on his deathbed, he's like, I'm never going to get married. I'm never going to have kids. You're, the dukedom will die with me. You wanted an heir so badly and now... I'm the last guy. These little swimmers in my balls ain't going to sire no more dukes. The line ends, Papa. And he dies thinking that that's true. Like he kind of kills him with that news. And then he falls in love. And of course, she she wants a family. That's all she wants. Uh, Daphne. And Simon, the duke, has has made an oath uh, sworn that he would never have a family because he hates his father so much. And she's so naive, she doesn't even realise how babies are made. That's the hilarious thing. Because they're shagging, shagging, shagging. Thinking about it afterwards, I was going, oh yeah, there was like a montage of shagging. But it's actually not a montage. It's them having sex in real time. It's just because he only lasts for about four minutes and I don't think she even had an orgasm until like the second last episode. But they're like basically shagging for three episodes nonstop. Um, well, nonstop for a very limited uh, amount of time. He's like uh, pumping away. And then all of a sudden, he, you know, he obviously he pulls out and he like, you know, comes on the ground or comes in a tree or comes in a handkerchief. And uh, she doesn't know what's going on. And she just thinks that he can't have kids. Uh, I mean, I don't know how he would know that he can't have kids or not. It seems like a bit of a stretch. And then she, like, talks to uh, her handmaiden who's come to live in the Duke's residence because they've got a big spanking gaff. And she's like, tell me how babies are made. Tell me everything. So then uh, she realizes that he's, uh, you know... He won't let his precious seed near her raised uh, bed. Some gardening terminology there. And uh, so she has sexy time with him. And she basically gets on top for the first time. He's like surprised. He's like, oh, what's this position? And she basically pins him down, even though he's like six foot two 
and she's like five foot six and uh you know he can't like throw her off and she's like uh grinding away and he oh there's someone that's alive for you and then he goes oh my god you've stolen my seed and he basically goes around on a huff to wait until uh she uh, gets her period or not and it's very tense and it's like ding dong will these two ever get along and I don't want to spoil it for you but they do um, it's light it's frothy uh, everyone's clean uh, because they're in a costume drama they didn't go back in time and it's multicultural uh, there's a lot of diverse ethnicities in it which I like as well because you're just focusing on the characters I mean it's a fantasy so the people giving out about the fact that there's different ethnicities and this is um, they're basically racists masquerading as history buffs so fuck them Um, now the other thing I watched uh, was Wonder Woman 84. Now, I was a big fan of the first Wonder Woman movie, which came out in 2017. I had very low expectations of it because Wonder Woman as a character was introduced in Batman v Superman, Dawn of Just Ice, uh, where they learned how to make ice through Superman. It had it on his home planet. He was like, oh yeah, we have this thing. If you just freeze water then it's uh it's ice they're like ice and it changed the cocktail industry forever um but they chose not to do that origin story uh they just had to squeeze in batman into it and they had to squeeze in wonder woman and she's in it a bit and then she shows up at the end and i'm like oh okay wonder woman yeah it's just so they could have the holy trinity of of uh DC Comics, uh, DC standing for Detective Comics. So DC Comics is Detective Comics Comics. And uh, yeah, that's their main three, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman. So then the Wonder Woman movie came along and I was like, all right, this is probably going to be terrible. But it was really good. Like as a blockbuster movie, uh, it wasn't dumb. It was entertaining. Uh, the romance between Chris Pine and Wonder Woman was was very good. Uh, because she'd lived on her island of Mascara, or whatever it was called, and she'd never seen a man, um, like her daddy was Zeus or whatever, but she'd never met him. He's a, you know, he's an absentee father. He's living in the clouds. He's a busy, he's a busy god. He's got lightning bolts to throw at mortals that he doesn't like for some reason. Yeah, Wonder Woman was very enjoyable, had shades of the original Richard Donner Superman, uh, kind of an optimistic superhero. Like, she was very naive as to the world. She didn't really know what war was, you know, because they fought war with, you know, blades and uh, arrows. And then Chris Prime, Chris Prime, Chris Prime uh, the original Chris Pine, uh, before they started cloning him, you know he he flies in on his uh, and crashes, and she saves him. And then all the 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 World War One Germans discover the island of Mascara, and they come on the beach, and there's a big fight. But they're using guns, and it's like, what are these guns? And it's just the horror of mechanized, uh, industrialized war. She's never really encountered it before, and she's like this lovely she's got this lovely optimism about her and there's that wonderful scene where she's on uh, no man's land and she takes on the the german army basically by herself and it's you know it's like she's basically what the fuck come on i'll kill these lads get behind me you silly men and it was nice and empowering without hitting you over the head with it it was just about the character and I liked that character. And then the sequel, which was delayed, obviously, was supposed to come out 
fucking months and months ago. When was it supposed to come out? March or April or something? So they finally said, look, we'll put it on Christmas Day. And a lot of people were saying, reviews were coming out saying, so, so bright and fun. Wonder Woman 84 is the movie we need for the times we live in right now. Uh, Blah, blah, blah. No, that's not true. It's terrible. It's a terrible, terrible movie. Probably the worst sequel I've ever seen. Um, And I was kind of looking forward to it because I thought, you know, well, obviously, Patty Jenkins, who directed the first one, and maybe she had to fight for a few things. I think the No Man's Land sequence in the first movie was a kind of a last minute addition. And, uh, you know, a lot of people were saying that's maybe the best thing about the movie. And she had a lot more control this time. But it it just, from the very get-go, like it opens with a flashback to her as a little child competing in the Amazonian Games or Olympics with fully grown Amazonian women. I don't know why she's doing it. I don't know how she's allowed. I guess because she's like, you know, she's the princess. She's the queen's daughter. So she can do whatever the fuck she wants. And that sequence just went on and on and on and on forever. It's like 70 years since Chris Pine uh, died. He died in the first movie. Spoiler alert if you haven't seen the first movie. I should have said spoiler alert before I said he died. But he dies in the first movie. And then he comes back. How does he come back? Uh, It's a wishing stone. She wishes him to return. And he comes back. But he like quantum leaps into some other lad's body. It's very weird. Like he takes over a man's body. And she can see him as Chris Pine. And then he looks in the mirror. And it's like in Quantum Leap. When Sam has leaped into the body. And he can see the person whose body he's taken over. And she has sex with him. So she's having sex with Chris Pine, but Chris Pine is in this man's body. So he's not consenting to this sex. So you could say that Wonder Woman is raping this man, uh, even though she's having sex with Chris Pine. Now, I'm not saying that. I'm saying you could say that. And maybe some people on Twitter have said it. But hey, Twitter is where discourse goes to die. And a lot of people were saying that, oh, well, if the movie came out in in the theater and the theatrical experience would have made it a better movie. No, no, no. It's just a bad movie. She has, you know, she's she's never had a boyfriend since Chris Pine died. It's 1984. He died in like World War One. So it's like 70 years later. And all she's done is sit around and pine for Chris. It's just, it's a very, very dumb movie. And K- uh, Kirsten Wig is in it as uh, Cheetah, Pedro Pascal, a.k.a. The Mandalorian. Uh, he's, uh, what's his name, Max uh, Lord or something. And he's like a businessman. He's basically like a sort of a kind of a sort of a Trump. He's like a sleazy businessman who is basically a con man he's 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 trying to pretend that he's a big oil guy but he's bought these oil fields and they're empty and then he's doing research he's looking for this wishing stone the dream stone or whatever it is then if you hold it and and wish for something it'll grant your wish and like uh kirsten vig's character who's kind of klutzy and like no one wants to talk to her and you know men don't like her and uh, hassle her and she's like oh and then she meets uh, Wonder Woman and she thinks oh she's cool and she wants to be her friend and then she's like grabbing the wishing stone going I wish I was more like Diana little does she know what she's wishing for and of course it's one of these things where you wish for something but you know you lose something in return so she wishes for Chris Pine to come back because for 70 years she hasn't met any man as good as him and uh, he does come back, but she kind of loses her powers. And it's really, like, it's really, really bad. It's like, I don't mind a movie being kind of goofy and not making sense and having plot holes if the sum of the movie's parts add up to something good. The Christopher Nolan Batman movies, like, you know, even the the, the most celebrated one of those, The Dark Knight, has got, you know, it's got plot holes and it's got things that don't make any sense. But you can excuse all that movie logic if the movie is good. If it builds up to something and it has a satisfying conclusion and it's a good, enjoyable movie. 
But this was just, huh? What? And, you know, at the start of it, Kirsten Wiggs, like, bumps into Diana and drops all her folders. And, and she's like, oh, I couldn't shut my briefcase properly. And she's like, oh, I like your shoes. And she's got, like, you know, animal print, cheetah print shoes. And then towards the end of the movie, she's like, you know, she, she wishes to be more like Diana. And she becomes stronger. And she has, like, the strength of her. And then she goes, uh, I want to be an apex predator. She says this to the Mandalorian, and he's like, uh, or uh, Max Lord, and he's like, oh, okay. Uh, like she doesn't wish for it. And then she just shows up, and she's like a cheetah woman. She's like a cat woman with the tail and everything. And at no point does she say, oh, I want to be a big cat woman. She doesn't say that. It just happens because she liked her shoes or something. I don't know. It's it's really bad, folks. It's um, they're making a third one. I, I I guess. I mean, it didn't. I don't know how much money it made, but uh, I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, I'd recommend it in a sort of a if you just want to watch something because you don't like things and you. It's fun sometimes to watch things that are bad, but I would not recommend it. Now, uh, we're going to take a little break, and we'll be back after these messages. Chief, there's something going on. And I mean to get to the end of it. That's right, you're going to get to the end of it, but you're going to do it with your new partner. Come on in. What? That's a lady cop. Lady detective cop to you. Please to meet you. What are you talking about, Chief? I ain't working with no lady cop. You'll do whatever I tells you to do, Johnson. Hey, what's the problem? I may be a lady, but I'm still a cop and a detective. Well, maybe the chief didn't tell you, but my last partner got killed because of a lady cop. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Her tits knocked over a whole meth lab, made a big noise, and they shot him. Well, I always keep my tits in check. Listen, chief, I don't want no lady cop with no perky tits messing up my scene. What are you talking about? It's not the 1960s. Starring Charles Jansen as Jimmy the Cop. I'm a cop. I'm a man, and you're a woman. Get out of here. Lindsay O'Neill as Lady Cop. Listen, you better respect me or I'm going to shoot you with my lady gun. And Charles Hansen as the chief. Oh, I'm tired. I need to sit down because my feet are sore. New from the No Budget Network, Detective Lady Cop. Guys, welcome back. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for listening to the podcast in the first place. I just want to thank you. Yes, you. You with the ears listening right now. I'm tickling your ear holes, and it's all consensual, so it's fine. I don't have to be cancelled. I am sitting here in the bedroom of one of my long-time uh, listeners and future brother-in-law, Neil Murphy. Hi, Neil. Hi, Claire. Um, how's it going? Uh, you can't answer me. Maybe you're answering out loud, but no one else can hear you. But uh, I left a little, tiny little gap for you to say whatever you wanted to do um, out loud. Now, I am in the bedroom of Neil, Neil's childhood bedroom, or at least teenage bedroom. And I'm just going to describe the room. There's a hairdryer in here for some reason. Neil does not have long flowing locks. There's a couple of... Um, there's an English dictionary. Uh, there's some old books and stuff. Uh, there is a large pile of uncut magazines, which are all from around the 2002-2003 era. Um, I have one here, which is from June 2003. Now, uncut. Is uncut still going? I don't know. I mean, do people read actual magazines? I have... Uh, a number of old Empire magazines uh, in my childhood bedroom, or rather teenagehood bedroom, because this house 
uh, like my house that I in Offley that my parents live in, that I also have a room in. Uh, we moved into that house when I was a teenager. I think I was in my late teens, in fact. And this house here uh, in Dublin, on the south side, on the south side, guys, is also a house that the Murphys moved into. But anyway, these uh, uncut magazines that I was talking about, which uh, there's quite a lot of them, and I've been just picking them at random and reading the long-form articles that they have, and it's just so much uh, more pleasing to my eyes and easier on my eyes than looking at it on a screen or looking at a poorly written article written by a Russian bot that has so much uh, grammatical and factual errors that your your brain just starts to bleed. Um, now, I'd like to read a tiny little article uh, in this 2003 issue, um, which is called Elvis's Sandwich, written by Simon Goddard, um, which is basically just about Elvis Presley and the food that he used to eat in the last few years of his life when he was um, my age. Well, actually, he was a year younger. He, he was 42 when he died. I'm 43, which uh, sounds old. But I guess it only sounds old if you're in your 20s. And what makes me sound old is giving out about young people talking about feeling old when they're like, you know, turning 24. God, age, huh? Creeps up in you. If I'm unlucky, I'll have a grey hair in four years. Um, so this is uh, The Ravenous King and his bank-breakingly extravagant idea of a midnight snack. Now, some of you may not know this. I am an Elvis Presley fan. I, I Well, I was an Elvis Presley fan. I guess I still am, but I'm not as ravenous in my uh, fandom uh, as I used to be. I was an official member of the Elvis Presley fan club Society of Ireland which was run by a man called Brendan Twomney. And uh, every month you'd get uh, a photocopied and stapled together so it looked like a sort of a half book, half leaflet. Like if a book and a leaflet got married and had a baby. A booklet, I guess you'd call it. A little baby booklet. And it would have, you know, articles and things and a message from the president of the fan club. I honestly don't know how much it was to join the fan club. I think it was like, you know, two pound for a year or something, which in today's money is 85 euro. No, I've no idea. It wasn't much. It was very, very little. So, um, but this is about his, his uh, foodstuffs. There's a picture of Elvis and he looks quite big, quite large because uh, he was still gigging. He just had his suits made bigger. But you can definitely see it in his face. It's uh, it's it's quite bloated. Um, so I'm just going to read this, this short little article just to give you an idea of uh, Elvis's eating habits. And it's really just kind of a warning. Uh, it's like if you're feeling down, if you're feeling blue, some people uh, take refuge in food. Some people don't. Some people do. It's what stoners call the munchies. A sudden, desperate attack of drug-induced hunger. Usually at a criminally unsociable hour of the early morning, bad enough that the sufferer would willingly surrender a limb in exchange for twice their body weight in chips with curry sauce. Now, I doubt Elvis would have been a chips and curry sauce man. It's more of a sort of a... an Anglo-Irish thing. By the last few years of his life, Elvis Presley was pickled by drugs. With blood like cough syrup. Oh my God. And a habit for packing his nostrils with cotton wool balls soaked in liquid cocaine. It's really no surprise that Elvis lived in a permanent state of munchiedom. Uh, cotton wool balls soaked in liquid cocaine. Oh my God. Luckily for the king, he also had the ways and means to satisfy such cravings, whatever the cost. The cost was his life. 
even if that meant chartering a private midnight flight over 800 miles at a cost of roughly $40,000 to quench his tortured belly rumblings for his favourite sandwich, as he actually did one night in early February 1976. This impromptu and elaborate sarny dash began while entertaining two law enforcement bigwigs at his Graceland home. After discussing crime prevention, his greatest obsession after food, Ironically, the king was fixated with cracking down on dope dealers and had a sizable collection of police badges and uniforms. Probably for role play. Elvis's attention turned to the men's home state of Colorado. Specifically, the best sandwich he'd ever tasted in his life, served exclusively at a particular diner in Denver named the Colorado Gold Mine Company. The more he thought about it, the more he drooled, and the more he yearned to savour the sweet taste of their unique creation named Fool's Gold. But it was midnight in Memphis and Denver was 800 miles away, as the lawmen were quick to point out. The lawmen are very good at distances. Elvis's hunger, though, respected neither time nor distance. Having recently acquired his own private jet, named Lisa Marie, after his daughter, the king suddenly saw a solution. We're going to get us some fool's gold. He whooped and with that phoned the airfield to prepare his aircraft for an emergency flight to Denver. An emergency flight. Within the hour, Elvis, his Colorado buddies, and their two pilots were above the clouds in the million-dollar interior of the Lisa Marie. That's shocking. I can't believe Elvis would let two police officers enter Lisa Marie. Unusually, Elvis himself was so excited that he dared not ruin his appetite, restricting his mid-air refreshments to just one bottle of Pepsi. By 2 a.m., the plane had touched down in Denver, with the forewarned Colorado Gold Mine Company were waiting at the airport with his, with his extravagant order. 22 Fool's Gold Sandwiches. Named after its knowingly ludicrous price tag just short of $50 a shot. A case of champagne for his guests and some mineral water for Presley, who, for all his nefarious pill-popping, at least could never be accused of being a boozer. They came, they feasted, they flew back. Needless to say, the majority of those sandwiches were for Elvis's consumption alone. So what exactly are the magic ingredients of Fool's Gold? Those of you with a queasy disposition should stop listening now. Try this for a surefire suicide by cholesterol. A whole fucking loaf of bread, hollowed out, cut in half, spread with a whole jar of jam on one side, a jar of peanut butter on the other, then stuffed until bursting with bacon rashers and given a final fry-off for luck. That night, Elvis chowed nearly 20 of the bastards, and to think there are those who were surprised when 18 months later he fell off his toilet and died. Wow. So, I used to hear... Now, that's the end of the article there. Simon uh, Goddard wrote that article in uh, Uncut magazine. Uh, thanks, Simon. A few things there. I used to hear uh, rumours that, yeah, Elvis would just basically fry anything. Um, he'd, you know, fry cornflakes and eat them. Um, but he used to fry cheeseburgers, deep fried cheeseburgers were his thing. But now, 20, eating 20 lo- hollowed out loaves of bread, a full loaf of bread, with a whole jar of jam and a whole jar of peanut butter and stuffed with bacon. So like, and fried, it says fried off. Now, I don't mean if it doesn't say if it's deep fried or fried in a pan. I imagine it's deep fried. And yeah, he fell off his toilet and died. Well, he was sitting on the toilet, had a heart attack, fell forward and was gripping the carpet. This is what I, I remember reading about it before he was his his fingers were gripped into the the carpet of the toilet uh so much that there were like rigor mortis had set in and when the authorities the coroner or whatever came they had to prise his fingers off the carpet it was like a really he was like gripping cuz he was uh the pain of his heart attack was uh just 
causing him to just grip the carpet. Now, my question is, why have a carpeted fucking bathroom? I used to live in a place in Galway and um, it was owned by my friend Martin's dad. Hi, Martin. Hi, Martin's dad. And it, there was a tiny little, it was a tiny little apartment room and there was a tiny toilet, but there was carpet on the floor. And of course, if you're piddling, now nowadays, um, I pee sitting down because uh, Shane Clifford recommended it and I've never looked back. Incidentally, Shane Clifford has a wonderful podcast um, called Shane's Brilliant Podcast. Check, check it out. So it's, you don't get any kind of splashback really at all. You sit, you drop your, drop trow, sit on the toilet do your biz, do a little shake, 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 shake your penis, shake your penis. And uh, then you just stand up, pull your pants up. You don't even have to wash your hands because you have not touched the member, the offending member. So, but if you're standing up and you're peeing, there's going to be some splashback. You're not going to get it Exactly, and even if you just get it on the a drop on the seat, a little bit will go on onto the floor, and if the floor is carpeted, then it's going to be, you know, covered in wee wee, and then it dries off, but the ammonia will rise up, and it'll just smell awful. So, I mean, I don't know why Elvis would have had carpet in his in his toilet, because if he's eaten like twenty loaves of bread stuffed with peanut butter and jelly and and rashers, he's going to be using the bathroom quite a bit. Anyway, we probably have several of them in Graceland. Anyway, guys, listen, I have been uh, living in this house for the last uh, couple of weeks, and I've been getting to know Kara's father, Tom, who I feel I can talk about on the podcast because I don't think he's ever going to listen to this podcast, but I know that his son's are going to listen to it. Both Neil and uh, Ronan, regular listeners of the pod. Hi, Neil and Ronan. Uh, now, Tom's a very funny man. And, uh, you know, we've, we're we we're different people. Uh, he's never played a, a, a video game in his entire life. And there was a lovely moment where I've been recently replaying The Last of Us, which I played on the PS3, uh, but I got a copy from my friend Kevin, remastered for the PS4. And I had used headphones before when I was playing Red Dead Redemption 2, which made me appreciate the game design even more. I could hear like the birds and whatever. But but the difference between um, playing The Last of Us, which I was playing and enjoying, but also it was kind of making me a little bit depressed and a a little bit sad because if you don't know the plot of the game is a virus breaks out that turns everyone into kind of zombies Uh, it's a kind of a spread by spores and people get infected and it takes over their brains with fungus and they just become kind of murderous bloodthirsty people um, in the same same way that in 28 Days Later, uh, people are not zombied, in that zombies are the recently deceased come back to life. That's the definition of zombies from George Romero's 1968 classic uh, horror movie, The Night of the Living Dead. Those are zombies. These are infected. So, you know, they don't walk slowly. They run at you and they're quite vicious and scary. And some of them are very, very large and monstrous and covered in hard kind of spored uh, kind of uh, fungal plates and things. And it's a very different um, game to Red Dead Redemption 2, which is an open world game. So you're on like this massive map and you're going up the mountains and you can see way off in the distance. You're in the wide open plains of uh, America Whereas The Last of Us, you're in a post-apocalyptic world. You're in an old abandoned 
hotel and all the lights are out and you can hear and the floor is above you and you can hear pipes and you can hear murmuring and, and screaming and it's actually quite terrifying and I'd never played it with headphones before and I was going to give up because of the, the because the plot and the whole virus killing off humanity was kind of a little bit too close to the bone and I was going to quit but then I, I persevered I was very brave guys and uh, put on headphones playing it and it just changed it entirely just made it frightening And I thought, ooh, I'd love to play the Alien Isolation game like this, even though I've played it before, just to replay it. But it's a great game. It's kind of sort of a little bit depressing. It's extremely violent, I realized as well, because I was playing it and Kara was sitting beside me reading something. And then the uh, infected would come at me and I'd like be blowing them off with uh, (laughs) shotguns blowing their heads off with shotguns, not blowing them off. The only way to stop the infected is to sexually arouse them. Um, That's a different game entirely. That's the porno game version of The Last of Us, which is called The Last of Bums. (laughs) Oh, God, I really haven't done stand-up in a long time. That's just a terrible joke. Uh, But I'm going to leave it in because I want to be honest with you guys about my process. Um, so yeah, Carol was saying, God, this is incredibly violent, isn't it? And scary. And I was like, yeah, I mean, that's the base of the game. So I put headphones on and I was like, oh my God, this is, this changes everything. Um, so I'm continuing to play it and I actually enjoyed it the other night cause I got so lost in it. I got really involved and it just took my mind off the actual real world events that are, uh, strange and terrifying. Um, but Kara's dad came in to the room and uh, was like, well, lad, how are you getting on? I was like, grand. I said, what's this? Looking at the screen and I said, oh, it's a video game. And he went, video game, video game. And I said, yeah, it's uh, it's basically you're uh, trying to avoid zombies in a sort of a post-apocalyptic world. And he just uh, stood there, kind of looked off into the middle distance and just repeated the words that I'd said and just went, post-apocalyptic world. And then turned and left. <laughs> and it was a lovely little moment. And uh, and then he said to Kara when she came in the room the next day, because I said it to Kara and she thought it was very funny. I said it was, it was very funny. Um, Because he kind of said it and then left because he's like, I can't contribute to this conversation. And uh, yeah, Kara came into the kitchen and he was on his laptop looking at, I don't know, old cars online or something. And uh, Kara says, hello, father, what are you up to? And he said, killing zombies, Uh, which I thought was funny. I don't know know why she said it to her. He could have said it to me. Um, But it's grand. And... uh, he he's a nice man and uh, we both drink guinness and uh he has a healthy disdain for um television programs uh one thing he does do which is strange is well not strange he watches turkish dramas on netflix like uh there's like soap operas and there's whole movies so he watches them with subtitles and I don't know how he got on. I don't know how the algorithm turned him on to that. And I don't know how he hasn't gotten off of it, but he enjoys them. And who am I to say yay or nay? Uh, anyway, guys, this has probably been uh, a longer episode than you would have hoped for. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. And there will be a Sleeps of the Fishes episode coming up very soon uh, which will be all about my favourite western, one of my favourite westerns and one of my favourite movies of all time The Good, The Bad and The Ugly you can get that early if you're a patron of Edwin Salmon of Knowledge and if you don't want to become a patron, that's fine I appreciate that times are hard for people 
including me and including you. Uh, but if you want to maybe, I don't know, give my podcast a review, I think you can do that on Apple Podcasts. I don't know if you can do it on other sites. I have never reviewed my own show or even tried. Uh, if you want to recommend me to uh, someone, you can do that. But uh, if you don't, that's also fine. I'm just glad that you listened. So I'll see you guys soon. And thanks very much for being there. Goodbye. Salmon of vanilla, just a salmon of knowledge, just a salmon of vanilla, just a salmon of knowledge, just a salmon of vanilla, just a salmon of knowledge podcast. Forgot, 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 forgot.